Back to the structures. The structures are becoming complex. And they start taking in more people and they start doing more complex jobs to the point that those involved end up devoting their energies primarily to the structure rather than the structure's initial apparent purpose. One thing about that I didn't have time for and not before last, is someone involved with this, my so-called real revolutionist, has got to continually refresh his knowledge of this fact. It's everywhere in life, it's in his job, it's in his personal relationships outside of this, and it's even here. Now, when it gets here bad enough, then I do something about it, or we're all done for. But even before I get around to these periodic shaking ups, you should be aware of the fact that you have fallen into wrestling with the structures. And the structures, as far as revolution is concerned, are ultimate gnats. And they are gnats. Don't write me. <laughs> gnats are, in this case, are devilish little creatures because you fall right into believing that this is super important, that I one time turned to you and said, you're in charge from now on of taking out the garbage after every meeting. Would you do so? And so then that becomes not that you necessarily are nuts enough to believe that taking out the garbage is going to put you at the right hand of Allah someday, but it gets to be a whole structure itself. I can paint a scenario that would hit many people somewhere within a spectrum of my words that becomes a big deal about you worrying about how soon you should get here. Well, it's up to you to buy the garbage bags. Whether you should go ahead and tell me that uh, you can't afford to buy the garbage bags, it should be our responsibility. Or maybe it's some kind of trick that I just said that, and it's up to you to figure it out by yourself. Or then to worry about, well, I was going on vacation two weeks from now, and he just said, would you be in charge of it? Can I get somebody else? What if they don't do it? Will you hold me responsible? God, what a drag this is. What the hell is that guy? The whole thing, it becomes your a whole structure, not just the taking out of the garbage which would take whatever it was, two minutes. It can be something that you think about continually. A real revolutionist has got to be aware of this fact that is going on even in his apparent or her apparent relationship to something like this. And what you've got to do is, in a sense, is use a kind of refined brute, a kind of civilized savage method where you continue to struggle to re-free yourself from all the entanglements that arise naturally from life's organic growth. Because anything that's growing, I refer you back to not before last, anything that's growing is going to take on a structure to such a degree. It's not a mistake. Nobody's at fault. Humanity cannot go around worrying about this. If they were aware of it, if I could play with justice and make ordinary people aware of it, and then they would, and they, like I'm saying that the revolutionists must, then people in general begin to struggle against this, it would be destructive. In other words, it's not going to happen, it shouldn't happen, and nothing is wrong. But there isn't anything in the city, at the ordinary level of life, anything that is alive is going to take on more and more a complex structure. There is no choice. It's not wrong. It's not incorrect. It's not even questionable. There is no choice. It must take on a, an ever-increasing complex structure. And those involved must more and more devote their energies to the structure, not the apparent initial purpose. The real revolutionist has got to free him or herself from that. You must continue to remind yourself that you are, in a sense, a civilized, felt brute. You have got to be in a process, like a kind of intelligent snake, I guess. You've got to continually try and shake, shed yourself, not just the possessions, which I still, even though I say I don't, I still encourage everybody about once a year you're going to throw away most of the shit you got. Just general principles. Anybody that doesn't like that, pretend that there was a glitch in the tape and you misunderstood me. <laughs> I don't, I know that's dangerous. I know it's dangerous and it's not any kind of rule, but I'm just telling you, you should. And of course, that's nothing. I told you every seven or eight years you ought to almost make yourself a stranger to yourself. If you could really do it, about once a year you ought to take most of what you are and just throw it out. I mean all of it. I mean stuff that you thought, that boy, am I a lot better off. Kudos to me. My good influence now has you doing so-and-so. 
Whereas a year ago, you, you just couldn't do it, but now you've got the strength to do it every day. About once a year, you look around, and every day is like a bad possession. That is, if it's taking on a structure, and you're wrestling with it, throw it away. It is like being a part of the good old Huns of history, sweeping across the plains. You just take what you need, and you don't keep anything. You should be continually shedding, and the actual physical possessions, of course, is of minor interest. Intrinsically, they are of no interest, because you're not going to get to heaven in a Cadillac. You're not going to go to paradise by having a Cadillac once and throwing it off a cliff or hanging the keys to a wino. Neither one's going to help. It's just irrelevant. It is the point that there is a structure has built up between you and your mode of transportation or between you and your house, between you and your clothes, between you and whatever, between you and your dreams of houses and clothes and automobiles. You have got to see that you are in the midst, just this is one example among a continuing string, you've got to see that whatever you're involved with, all the way from your job to this, to personal relations, to hobbies, that whatever you're in, you end up with some group of people, a few people, and they seem to share your interest, and et cetera. Nothing is amiss yet, but you must see that if you are in a place where your hobbies or where your interests may be fed, then simultaneously you are going to very shortly be, if not already, as soon as you step into it, you're going to be in the midst of a group of people whose interest is now primarily devoted, that is energy, when I say interest, is devoted to keeping up the structure. So you've got to watch that if you're going to be a revolutionist. You have got to shed that. You've got to continually try and strip yourself of your entanglement with the structure. And it's not just necessarily to do it physically, that is materially, in the same way it's not necessary that you actually throw out most of your possessions once a year. You know I don't mean that literally, unless you take it seriously. And if you'd benefit, hell, do it. I don't care. You know, if you don't care, I don't care. But physically, materially, for me to say shed yourself of all the structures, that doesn't mean necessarily that you step in, that you decide that you want to take up numismatics. And you figure the fastest way to do it is I'll find out that there is a club here of other people that collect coins, and I'll go there, and I'll join up with them, and I'll hang around and see if I like it. Or get a quick education. It's easier than going to the library and having to read damned old books. I go over there, and I'll talk to people. It doesn't mean just because you get there and you find out that, like my bird watchers of night before last, that these people are spending more time worrying about the club than they are coin collecting. That doesn't mean anything. You can still go over there and get what it is you wanted after a few hours, a few days, a few weeks. You might get tired of it, or you might get what you wanted to, to know to get started, and then you can leave it, or you might stay. You might stay and realize that these people are more tied up. It's reached the point, this organization, this particular club that I've joined up, these humanistics that they are now more involved, their energies are more being spent keeping up the structure than they are the actual hobby. That doesn't mean that you just have to walk away from it literally, but it's, you've got to, a revolution has got to have a continuing understanding that this is going on. There is no choice out in life. It's not a question of, is this going to happen to this group? If it hasn't happened, it's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen whether you're there, whether you're not there. But for your own benefit, for your own profit, you have got to have a continuing awareness of it and be continually as I said, I was saying once a year, that's not really a magic number, but at least once a year, you should be like a snake. You should be able to shake yourself, shed yourself of some of your entanglements with the structures, and it doesn't have to be just literally. It doesn't mean that you've got to leave and never go back to that club. But you've got to remind yourself that you are, in a sense, an undercover Attila, that you simply slipped in there, and you personally have got not the slightest goddamn interest in their fucking club. That is the structure. I do a lot of profanity not to curse poor old coin collectors. But for you to realize that these people are as much, at the very least, let's say, as much, the point when you get to it, involved in keeping up the structure of the club as they are the hobby, then you've got to realize that. You've got to continue to remind yourself of that and realize that it's of no benefit to me. Not simply because it's going to take away time you could be spent on you coin collecting. It's not that, because it doesn't matter about that. It's that you don't need to be entangled with life's mechanical, organic growth in these structures, no matter what it is, whether it be a religion, a social club, personal relations. When it reaches that point, even if you don't materially leave it right then, is be able to shed, like the frontiers between you and that, the place where you are in the structure, is to don't play with it. 
Let them do it. They got along without you being there. The structure will hold up. If it's about to fall apart and you want the club to keep going on, then ask them. You know, can I do anything that won't cost me any money or time to help keep the club together? If so, if so, do it. Well, that was the primary thing I was going to wrap up a little bit from Wednesday. Uh, now try this. Since this is completely different, and will give you a chance to take a good fresh breath and go on to something new and different. I don't intend to lie, but... <laughs> Twee! To what possible ends are things arranged in a certain way thusly? And the thusly I have in my little mind is that men will die for their ideas while not doing so, not being wired up, not being prepared to do so, and matters much more, let us say for a moment, physical, such as their health, which by any reasonable city yellow circuit standard should be much more likely and apparently much more profitable. But that men are wired up, the more you get into life's leading edge, like this part of the planet right now, the Western world, but the, the more complex be the creatures as a tribe, as a nation, then the more there is this, wired in, that people will literally die or be prepared to die for their ideas, whereas they could get into matters that just to look at, to hear about, you would think these other matters that are much more material and physical, they're not prepared to do so. Such as be under conditions where there's a forced change of your diet. There's a change in uh, a group, a tribe, a nation is conquered by another group. You're put into forced labor. You're captured. They force you to move your residence. They force you to change the way in which you live. Now, I assume that all of you know enough about history, and if you don't, you've seen enough movies, and we'll just take movies as being history. It's good as going to college and save a lot of money. It's more entertaining, and plus, most, most movies don't last but 90 minutes, and you're out of there. <laughs> But all of you know in movies, somebody will be captured by these dastardly heathen foes. And they'll tell the people, all right, you are now in our hands, and from now on, you people, we don't care whether you're officers or enlisted men, from now on, you'll get up at 5.30 and you'll work like dogs, and you'll eat nothing but tree bark and suck on tar out of the highway, <laughs> and none of you can practice we know that some of you had a religion that you had certain restrictions on your diet <laughs> don't even mention that to us and plus all of you we captured you here in your hometown we could stay here but we're not we're going to make all of you move across the country and all the ones we captured over there are going to have to move here does anybody none of you like that anybody want to say anything and of course they lined up with guns and all the recruitments of war and you know in the movies, and everybody's standing there, and they're going to look like, and they'll look at each other like, well, that sounds pretty bad, but they're going to get serious. And sure enough, finally, this dastardly head man of the camp will say, oh, and all of you are going to have to verbally repudiate your past allegiance to your ruler and your religion if you had any. And then suddenly all these people are ready to, you know, be shipped over somewhere else and to suck on tar and eat. They all suddenly hear mumbling and people start saying, no, 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 no. You can shoot me, but I'm not going to repudiate my ideas. To what end is life arranged that way? That without, I'll say apparently, because I keep doing that on the 3D level, that the way you perceive it at first, that people are prepared to be just run through a kind of human-driven, turbine meat grinder be beaten starved pushed around all of this I'm using those kind of examples any more you can think of to try and differentiate which is you should be able to hear me that they will take all sorts of literal physical material punishments and threats of punishments 
goes under the condition. They look around. We're outnumbered. They got all the guns, and we're tired, and we've already been conquered. And so they'll go, all right, all right. I don't like it. And boy, first chance I get, I'll escape. But they'll all go, all right, all right. Until they say, but you're going to have to renunciate, renounce some of your ideas. And suddenly people say, no, you can shoot me. But I am not going to say that I hate my king. No. You can starve me. You can beat me. You can make me get down and clean out the cesspools behind everybody's house. But I am not, no, I will not say I hate my king. To what? Of course, you people should be good enough to forget all these past mythological dreams and etc. Try, try and push the little 3D brains of which we all got our patent pending, we're all in business. Try and push it to the point to think just molecularly. For the human nervous system, the organisms of man that are necessary here, to what end, to what possible end are things so arranged that people will die for something that is at 3D level, is non-physical. And that a person could say, uh, all right, I might say that I renounce my king. And the commander of the camp says, oh, by the way, those of you who immediately go ahead and renounce your king and tell your god to get stuffed, you guys will do that, by the way, you're going to get two extra portions of tar to suck on every day. <laughs> In other words, you'll be rewarded. You'll be rewarded. <laughs> to what possible end does life have things arranged so that these people will be prepared to be beaten and mistreated physically and perhaps killed? And go, and they'll do that. But when it comes to something that at 3D level, ordinary people in the city could say, well, you're talking about two different things, which they always say that, the dichotomy between the voice in the body, between the mind and the body, between the soul and the carnal structure of man, all those kind of divisions. They would say, right, there are two different divisions. Right now, I, I'm just saying that up to tell you that there's no complaint. Just go ahead with that, that that's the way life is arranged, that ordinary nervous systems believe that. But to what possible end is it that people will not die? as a rule for things that seem to be quite physical. That they'll go along with their captors. They'll go along with the threat of punishment all the way to death until it gets to the place of your ideas. I'm using that as a catch-all. We could say your ideals even. But something that is not physical. They don't require you to move. They don't require you to work extra hours. They don't require you to get by on just half portions of tar and bark. They simply tell you, you must stand up they may even say, all right, I've, we've had enough of you damn prisoners, so what I'm going to do, you don't have to stand here in front of each other. All you got to do is come in my office one at a time and just come in, and I'm going to give you a chance. Nobody's I'll be outside the door. Just come in and say, I renounce my king, and that's it. And people start saying, no, no, go ahead and shoot me. Don't even bother to call me in and shoot me. I'm not going to do it. To what possible end are things arranged in this manner? See if you can see a connection between what I have just sort of asked and try and reconsider the possible chemical, electrical effect on the nervous system that unexpected, willful silence has. You hadn't forgotten that. That's only been a week or so ago. While I'm here, I said, could you see the connection between this phenomenon of people being prepared to die for their ideas as opposed to being prepared to die for mistreatment of their, just their physical self? And the chemical, the electrical, the molecular shock the effect it has on the human nervous system for a person to willfully, unexpectedly, go silence in to the ordinary flow that's going on. So remember where I was. Somebody should. 
I was going to take a side trip, I used the two adjectives of willful and unexpected silence. But while I'm here, does anybody, can you see right quick that the unexpected is always willful? Always. Now it's been a while since I think I just let Kairu do it in the past that I have pointed out, or had him, let him point out, that ordinary people are not truly surprised. The unexpected does not really happen to people in the city. Oh, oh, I know people say it does. I know people probably saying it does right now. That somebody somewhere, maybe within a block of where we're all sitting, here and in other places. At any given time, there's somebody saying at least to himself, if not these exact words, what they're saying is, God, how unexpected this has happened. But now, if any of you are in any sort of real dimensional touch with your own nervous system, and thus your own past, and thus parts of the past of the history of man, at least, you really know, at the very least, maybe you can't see this clearly to begin with, but at the very least, when I point out that nothing really truly unexpected happens at the ordinary level, it should sort of strike you as, yeah, that doesn't sound right, that doesn't sound like a right description, but as opposed to me actually feeling like things have been unexpected in life, that does sound fishy. Now that I look at it in a certain way, it is fishy. It smells bad. Because nothing has really ever happened, nothing happens as generally in the city that is unexpected. And this is not simply a human phenomenon. It is a life phenomenon. The unexpected does not happen. If it does, it is synonymous somewhere with a willful act. So I was being redundant to say the unexpected, willful intrusion of silence into the flow of life. Because if anything happens in the flow of life, let's go back to the level of man and not just life, the life of life. But if anything truly unexpected happened, and I'm not going to stay here long as a side trick, track, <coughs> so you don't have to work on it yourself. When you begin to see that ordinarily things are not unexpected, even things that you can go, what a surprise. It was not unexpected. The unexpected has to be willful. If it's not, and if it's not willful on an individual level that some human did it, it is simply the larger flow of life going through man. And there is nothing unexpected can happen. And if it does, it was willful. The only thing that, in an unexpected way, that could happen to you is something that you willfully did. Now, enough of you have had enough experience, along with all my excursions and attempted tricks and hypnotism and drugging your coffee and your own efforts, to know that there is a particular feeling when the time is right and the ambiance is balanced in just a very precarious way that you do something that you would not have normally done, that you say yes when you should have said no, that you smile and thank somebody for something that you would like to kick them in their privates ordinarily. That is unexpected, but it must be willful and it tastes unlike anything else. It is truly unexpected. It is truly willful. They are synonymous to a revolutionist. They are synonymous in the city except no one can see it. Now back to the main branch of where I was. Can any of you perceive a connection between my questions as to what end are people prepared to die for their ideas as opposed to that which would seem to be much more immediate, material, and profitable, and much more likely of things such as their health, their physical well-being, their comfort? The, the connection between that and a willful induction of silence when things are flowing along. The silence when it is unexpected, that is, it was willful. If you'll remember those are synonymous, but when it is unexpected, you put a molecular shock. It is not a psychological shock. It is not simply that people are surprised. Or it's not simply that people are waiting for you to make a comment and you don't and they get upset or they... True, it's all those things, but that doesn't tell you anything. You have put a molecular shock in the structures going on because you and another person, let's just make two people, 
the structure that was already built up, whether it just took 30 seconds, three minutes, maybe it's been over a period of 30 years. But there is a structure, and it's blah, 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 over here, blah, 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 and it's your turn. And you refuse to blah, blah. It's not just limited to a molecular shock in your mechanical system, in your line level of consciousness, which it is, and it's not just a potential shock, which it is, to the other person, when it is truly unexpected. But it has a ripple effect on the structure itself. There's not normally identified that there is some kind of structure between you and the other person, or you would not have engaged over the period of time just to go blah 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 blah. There was some structure. And of course it was much longer than that, like somebody had been living, two people living together for 30 years, and then suddenly one day. It's like you two are dancing. You're doing a variation at least, and it's probably just a little teeny weeny. And of course, if I could really tell you the correct, it's no variation at all. I'm trying to at least keep you people semi-sane at your sitting down level, that you and the other person doing a dance, and you've been doing this for you know, 30 years, and it comes time to do this particular dip, and you stop. And the person is ready to fall back on their back. You truly faux pod. You truly missed up as far as they're concerned. It was an unexpected intrusion of that great booger boo silence. I ask you again, can any of you see any connection between people being prepared to die for their ideas and let's shoot it off in two possible directions people being either prepared to talk about their preparation to die for their ideas, or those prepared to be silent over their apparent preparation to die for their ideas. Does that take the convoluted prize for the night? How about, since Attila and the Huns had a bit of exposure, how about let's throw in those great historical heroes, Jesus and Socrates. Apparently two people, and for you new people, if you can, try your best to forget, have any question with an imaginary structure as to whether these people existed, whether one started religion, whether the other one started a franchise chain of restaurants. <laughs> Take it that history remembers certain things the same way that people live the lives they remember they lived. History, the history of man at the level we're talking about, that I'm using words, the history of man is what the history of man remembers that people live. So forget whether these people existed, that's not the point. Now I guess some of you newer people might say, well, perhaps you're referring to them in an archetypical manner, and perhaps I am. <laughs> so if that, if that helps you deal with that. <laughs> but look, you had two people, these two historical, supposedly real people, and both of them apparently died for their ideas, right? One of them talked, if I recall, last time I glance through the apology or whatever they call it of Socrates right before he's going to drink it when they said do you have anything to say the man went on longer than Governor Clinton did at the Democrat convention <laughs> the man talked up a storm I mean it was good he told them he told them why that he understood why they're asking him if they had anything to say he told them what they were all thinking he told them what they thought they were doing for the city he told them what he that they thought he was thinking then he actually told them what he was thinking he covered it all. Then we got this other figure. And there are other stories like this, but Jesus, of course, is the best known. Here's this other guy, apparently prepared to die for his ideas, and they ask him, what would you like to say? He said, you know, say something. You know, punch old pilot kept saying, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> you know, the wife and I are late for an orgy, would you, you know, just say something. <laughs> It's like in modern courts, you, know, you either got to plead guilty or not guilty, and under the American and the Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence are, if you stand there and refuse, if the elder you don't know it, it is de facto a plea of not guilty. And it goes down as that, that that is your official. So in other words, you are forced to say something, whether you do orally or not. But back to the historical. 
and me asking you, do any of you see any connection between being prepared to die for your ideas and the sudden, unexpected, willful induction into the nervous system, into the structure, into the flow going on of that scenario of silence? <coughs> but there are two possible branches going after that when I ask you about the possible connection of being prepared to die for your idea. Now try right quick, so let's get away from any notion your nervous system has that I'm actually referring to people who died actually martyred them, that's beside the point, even if those people actually lived, that is, Socrates and Jesus. Now back to a personal level that I suppose that you would have to think of right now as being somewhere in the area of metaphorical, that there seems to be things so strong in the human nervous system. I don't mean this. You had it, all of you had it before you ever run across me in this. There seems to be things that you would die for, if not philosophical or religious ideas, well, many people will say that they'd be willing to die if somebody's going to talk about their mama, if somebody's going to attack my country, if somebody's going to attack my region of the country, if somebody's going to attack the particular group of huts in my village where I'm from. That all away from religious, nationalistic, chauvinistic, sexual, racial feelings, there seems to be areas that you're getting very close that many people are prepared. They're just born that way. In the city, they can say, they could claim that, well, I got this somewhere. My father was just a goddamn stainless steel patriot. He drove me crazy, and I guess that's why I'm prepared to be that way. You don't get involved in that because then you're, you're already forgetting that what seems to be your environment is simply other people's heredity. It is simply that people all over this planet, all over history, all over the place, underfoot, seem prepared to die for ideas. But then when it reaches that point, then it seems to spread out that one group is prepared to discuss it. And I'm not being sarcastic when I was talking about discuss it almost ad nauseum in the length to which Socrates did. It doesn't have to be at one time that you're actually about to die, but you're prepared to talk. Don't forget, don't worry about sitting there on the bench according to who painted the painting, David, of the death of Socrates and all of his henchmen around, and he sits there with the hemlock. No, he did that in front of the Senate, did anyway. I don't mean you had to do it all at one time. It may take you 50 years to give your death speech, to give your apology, but you're doing it continuously, little bits at a time about, well, there's certain shit I won't put up with, and there's certain things I actually believe in, and I would do anything to pursue these beliefs. Of course, I can't do it right now because i got to be at work. <laughs> but it is, you are prepared, you say. When I say you say, it is your nervous system talking. It is not you. It is not your cultural background coming through. It is your nervous system saying, I am prepared to die if it come to it for certain ideas. And you spend 50 years discussing it, talking about that I am prepared to die. That is one possible branch that I was using for this unexpected historical lesson that I was using Socrates as being the archetype. That, okay, I'm going to die. You know, I know what you people have in mind. I know what you expect me to say. I know, that all, I know that if I would just go blah, 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 and say so and so, you'd say, okay, that's enough. You can go home. I know that. I know that. You don't have to tell me that, but I know that you'll let me go if I just go, hey, I was wrong. That's all you want. And everybody says, face, I understand all that. And yeah, I know I understand most of you don't want to kill me. But that ain't going to do, because I'm not going to do it. So you might as well go ahead and send after the hemlock. I'm going to talk for a while, but you might as well have it here, because I'm going to drink it, because I know what you're going to do. That is a continual discussion. It doesn't have to happen in 30 minutes at the end of your life. It happens throughout the 50 years in which you live of discussing it. And then me using Jesus as being a kind of archetype of somebody else. In this case, uh, the story sort of is that, if I remember, that Pilate even hints. Well, believe me, that would have happened. The story is not historical anyway. But he would have said, hey, look, you're accused of such and such. Just say it's not true. You know, I, I told you I'm in a hurry. Just say it's not true. Say something. You know, say something. I don't give a damn. You know, I don't care about this. You know, I'm an outside. You know, he's named a circuit judge. He's named from the same. You know, this is none of my business. That was the basis. You know, just say something so we can all save face.
it is not that one in the city is preferable to the other, but there is a connection. And there's a lot more to it. We got to turn on the tape. Let me think a minute. After they turn on the tape, and I'll see if I'm going in more. But of course, you knew I was about to say there's a lot more. You thought I was going to say to it than I'm saying. But I'm not going to say that. Just turn on the tape. <laughs> You will tell me when it's uh, five minutes before stopping time, right? Which will be 10 after, is that correct? Okay. Let's see if we can bring something else into this. Oleo, potpourri, mulligan stew. Of life having produced and made available to the human nervous system the two great ever popular areas of reasons and excuses. The times I talked before about that, the one and a half times, I did not really say this directly, but the real revolution that somebody involved with this is confronted with this being a part of life, it's part of his nervous system, her nervous system, at line level, it's a part of life's nervous system, that there is perceivably, from every individual's viewpoint, according to what seems to be the circumstance and their particular involvement with the structure of the circumstance, that there is a perceivable difference between excuses and reasons. Now the first thing, and perhaps even the last thing, if you understand that the revolutionist has got to be concerned with is this, that the revolutionists cannot tolerate excuses passing themselves off as reasons. And the reasons, in the case of the revolutionist, as being those things that if you could see them in their full three, if not four dimensions, would be anything that insulates what seems to be your connection with whatever was going on, with your, with the structure of whatever was going on, that would seem to insulate you from it, that would seem to relieve you of either having to make some comment willfully or either willfully having to make no comment. This is molecularly electrically, chemically, I'm not going to say impossible, but it is very upsetting to your system. It is disturbing, it is disquieting, it is very difficult to do. Because you're involved with something. And we, you have to get good enough to where I don't always have to say this, but you can't live your life, you can't even think back and use your ordinary recollections of the past like a movie, like a TV show. That is, you're not suddenly involved with this other person, this woman, this man. You're not suddenly in this job, such as you turn, or you go into the movie and sit down after the previews and after the opening credits, suddenly the movie starts. And there's this guy and this woman, and the guy's saying, listen, we can't go on like this. And of course, it slowly or quickly develops the, the premise of the movie. That is not life. It's not the movie's fault, but that is not life. Your memory that suddenly your memory says, this situation started. Not, maybe, not necessarily the situation between me and the person being romantically and sexually involved, but when it began to go sour, that it just suddenly happened. And your memory goes back like a movie, like that your whole life has been in these little small reels, whatever movies come in, but not as big as the movie, they're variable size. Your little reels only go on maybe for 30 seconds, five minutes. But it's like you can put them on, your memory just goes to where this started. Well, the first I'll tell you where the trouble started. I work hard, I got to play hard. And so, uh, I don't know, it was one night, I, I was coming in about my regular time on Saturday, you know, like 2, 2.30 in the morning, and she was waiting up, and she was waiting up, and she says, I've had it, you've been out with another woman. That's when the trouble started. That's when this damn trouble started, when she pulled out on me. But to you, that is to ordinary memory, it is as though you turned on a movie, and that's where this particular structure 
started, and it did not. There is no psychological buildup. There is no psychological explanation. It is simply that life is seamless. Ordinary consciousness, including memory, cannot perceive of there being a continual, non-stop, unseamed, unfettered, unencumbered panorama, cyclorama of time. The problem, as you call it, is ordinary memory and consciousness would call it between you and another person, whatever the structure is, but between you and another person, did not start where some real of memory started, any more than a movie about the life of Louis Pasteur. Started when you see, it suddenly it shows, Louis and good old Ms. Lewis staying there, playing around with soured milk and such and such, and she says, wait a minute, I think you've discovered something. And he says, finally, after all these years. Oh. And they're both 45 years old. And that's the beginning of the movie. That's what your memory does. That's why it seems acceptable in a movie, in a book. I'm not just speaking on movies and TVs, because that is human memory. That is human perception. A revolutionist. He's got to understand, he's got to see for himself that my memory operates this way. And this is not some big morass that you've got to swim and wrestle with the rest of your life. You've simply got to see that memory operates in a very particular, precise, as a matter of fact, once you begin to see it, molecular way. Not psychological, it's not singular with me, not particular form of memory. It's not even singular to me because other people have got the same memory of you that you do. Other people have got memories about themselves the same as yours. There is a collective memory. It is the memory of life. Yours seems to be of some consequence. It's supposed to. That yes, I have memories of all the ways my family mistreated me. This woman mistreated me. The woman before that mistreated me. And the woman before that. But there's no such thing. It's just your continual existence here. It is your continual place within the nervous system of life. And the real revolutionist has got to understand that memory produces what seems to be reasons but from the revolutionary view, not the city view. It's got nothing to do with ordinary people because ordinary people are doing just right. Now, this is an attack on ordinary people. But this is, again, one of the crucibles that you've got to be able to feel because this is not judgmental. And what I'm going to say in words, as always, sounds judgmental and it's not. But it has to. When you're dealing with binaries, it always has to sound like I set up something, I make some comment, whether it takes 30 seconds or 30 minutes, that I seem to weave this great yellow circuit or verbal sandcastle, and then I have to go, aha, uh -huh, and then look over here. Like compared to that, this is what the real revolution's got to do. And there is no such limit as binary choices, as you know. But here we are. This kind of acid test, one of them, it's a revolutionist to understand that in the revolutionary sense, the reality behind my words I'm saying now, that to a revolutionist, excuses. That is ordinary memory, ordinary consciousness. Try to pass themselves off as reasons. That is real data, useful information. And to a revolutionist, there is no such. Anything you can remember is shit. Well, that's technical uh, computer talk for you people that don't know. It's garbage. Anything ordinary me memory remembers is what I mean by an excuse. But don't look in the dictionary, you just got to until you see it, trust me, that I mean two separate things by excuse and a reason. And it's not what the dictionary says. I mean something else, but there are no words for it, and I'm not going to make up any. Anything that ordinary consciousness brings up, or for those of you who want to try and keep it in a more precise level, anything that comes up in your nervous system, you're just there and it comes up. You might as well be the Holland Tunnel, and suddenly you look around, there are cars and trucks. Does the Holland Tunnel take it personally? Not, not the Holland Tunnel I used to know and love. But the humans take it personally. I got a little gasp. Mm. Do you take that personally? I have this little sweat on my brain. I had this little weird thought. I had it. Everybody takes that personal. You didn't forget where we were, did you? There is a difference between what I mean by reasons and excuses. And a real revolutionist cannot let reasons pass themselves off. And they dress up. They put on disguises. And it's not just yours. Everybody does it. We all talk about it. And it's like this huge masquerade going on. And nobody, forget about nobody can see that the emperor is naked. That's not it. That was a nice story. And that was getting close. That was for children. I mean, even grown children. But the real one is everybody's dressed up in a funny nose and glasses. But everybody's dressed that way, and nobody knows that everybody else is that way. 
only the real revolution has got any business, any use, in perceiving that there is a difference. There is reality behind what I'm calling excuses and reasons, and he cannot, she cannot let excuses, that is, ordinary impressions, ordinary molecular activity in you, you cannot let any of that pass itself off as a reason. Because a reason, what I mean vis-a-vis -vis what I'm calling excuse, a reason would be useful, almost clinical. It would have to be fairly fresh information. And it's not a reason on the basis that other people in the city would use reason, even synonymous with excuses, for them saying, well, hey, the reason I wasn't here is my car broke down. A real revolutionist. He was supposed to be somewhere, and his car broke down. Now, I'm going to start putting in words, and this is very crude, very, very crude. It's no worse than the city, but you're supposed to be able to refine some of it through your own hearing. A real revolutionist. There he sits. He's not going to be where he said he would on time, and there the car. Now, there are all kinds of reasons and excuses come up. The main reason is he didn't plan the car to break down. I mean, that, that is your reason. If the people that you're supposed to meet won't accept that, you know, the hell with them. You got to be what? Reasonable. Yeah. All right, from certain views, from some other view, or even if we had the, a certain kind of person there, well, let's say somebody else. This will be easy for you to hear right quick. Somebody else could say, yeah, but that's a pretty poor excuse because am I not correct? Your car has been like running on three cylinders. You got about two Maypops on the car. That, that thing has been a rolling wreck now that I know of for about six months. Is that not correct? And the guy goes, well, yeah, but you know, I've been broke. Yeah, but see, don't, don't tell me that the reason that you weren't there to meet me on time was that your car broke down because that is not really a reason. It's really an excuse on your part because you have always driven this rattle trap. You've never taken care of it. I told you personally. The way that thing was smoking, the kind of noise I could hear. For one thing, I told you, you know, two weeks ago, I could tell you, I could hear the fuel pump. I could hear some belts on the water pump. I, could, I told you that, some, that your car was about to, you know. And the guy goes, yeah. <laughs> so the other person says, so don't try to tell me, young man, that the reason you were here is your car broke down because if you had a brand new car and you kept it up, and your car suddenly broke down. That's happened to me. <laughs> but, but what you're trying to tell me is that's simply an excuse. That's simply an excuse because you didn't make right preparations, blah, 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 blah. All right. In the city, there does seem to be that difference. But if this happened to real revolutionist, he could that fast consider all of that. Of course, whatever his nervous system immediately did, assuming his nervous system, which you're safe in assuming, always has that potential to take over. It's always operating. His old molecules that talk inside of him are still going on. They were doing it in Jesus and Buddha, Socrates, and even Attila, I hate to tell you, but it's still going on with all the great guys. It's always there. So there it is. His car suddenly blows up. He pulls off the road and looks at the watch, and he may fall right back to the good old level. That is, the good old level may rise right back up to him and holler, oh, God damn, we blew it. Maybe it's going to be a uh, severe disadvantage to him. And so you could almost look at it as like a, if we were talking psychologically, then he falls into like this psychological attempt to assuage himself from where he is that this is not my fault. The car broke down, so it's not my fault. The real revolutionist, though, would immediately, this is a crude way of putting it, but I've told you this before, and it's safe, just this fast, immediately, he would consider the opposite of that. Since that's what his nervous system says, my car broke down, it's my fault. Then he'd immediately bring in the other side of that just immediately. So he is already beginning to chew up the difference between what ordinary people would call reasons and excuses. But then, I remind you how crude this is, but you've got to find your own way because it has to do with sight. It doesn't have to do with learning my words. He would begin to see a kind of wide, four-dimensional panorama of how these kind of things happen in life. Not an excuse, but all the possible things. Not that any of them, he doesn't stop anywhere because none of them are the answer. But it's all the kinds of things that he's just aware of impartially, believe it or not. I know that word doesn't mean anything at the ordinary level. It doesn't. But he would impartially, he would objectively have a kind of immediate survey of the way he's lived his life, the way he mechanically lives his life, the way he lets things go, the way that he's not surprised. It's not unexpected that his car suddenly broke down. It is a whole panorama of him sitting here right off of interstate, I-94, 
at 4.30, approximately 25 miles from a place he was supposed to meet somebody for his own benefit. And here he sits, the car is smoking, it won't crank, he can't get there on time, there's no buses, there's no cars, there's no nothing, and there's no excuse, and there's no reason. All there is is life. And all there is for a revolutionist is his continuing expansion of perceiving this is life. And he cannot let excuses pass for reasons. But now if any of you heard any of that, he can't let reasons pass for reasons. <laughs> it is only a matter of, is there new information available? Which there always is. Not new excuses, not even new reasons. But the first step is, in a sense, that you cannot let ordinary reasons pass, I mean, excuses pass for reasons. There's nothing there. You might as well be chewing. It's bad enough for me to say something like you might as well be chewing prune rinds. That, you might as well be chewing prune rinds that are used. <laughs> In other words, you're dealing with something that there is no revolutionary nourishment. There's, you can chew it forever. You can spit them out and stomp them on the ground. You can try to dance on them like an Italian winemaker. There is no nourishment there, nothing. When you get past excuses trying to pass for reasons, and you understand that what I'm meaning by reasons tonight would be new information to you, not to tell to somebody else about why your car broke down and why you weren't there. It might be what you would see there sitting there as soon as you realize this car is not going to move, I'm not going to be there, I can't even call the people. That here is an... You might suddenly, this is even getting more crude, but some of you know this, you'll hear it. You might suddenly, in the midst of not getting caught in this, you might suddenly, this is real crude, but you might suddenly, I mean in a way that you almost have to get out and it takes your breath away, you suddenly understand something about you and your second wife, about your mother's relationship to your younger brother, about why there are two major political parties, why they're called everywhere in the world throughout history, or why it is that reporters continually say, it's not for myself I'm concerned, it's for the freedom of the press. new information that's always been there and of course it apparently to the situation as I was just painting that scenario to the situation of you sitting there with your car not functioning and you late then what you may see seems to be totally what irrelevant is that not strange yes but I'm prepared to buckle down and study all kinds of strange subjects now, if you'll just write all this down a book or direct me to the book that you learned it from, and I'll study it, and I'll learn it, and I'll memorize it. You may. You may be a man or a woman that has new facts. But you had not learned anything. You're simply caught up in a new structure. What you learn, what a revolutionist derives from what happens. Everybody else saying they learn from experience. A revolutionist learns, but it's not from what would observably be the experience. It's always something else. It always seems to be irrelevant. It always seems to have come around the corner from somewhere. Or when you get good, it seems as though, without you knowing it, you thought you were walking right along and you suddenly turned a corner. Not only have you never seen this alleyway, you didn't even see an alleyway when you were walking by, and suddenly there you are. If there was such a thing as describable, even three-dimensional, linear sequence of events, then I would have to say, if there were such, that it's the irrelevant. It is a world beyond what appears to be cause and effect, that there are some reasons, even excuses, for what's going on right now. It is an escape from that that suddenly makes you be somewhere. But as long as you are predictable, as long as you cannot do anything willfully that is slightly different, as long as you are caught up into the structure of being you, you can't ever do it. Now, I don't care what you do. You can be prepared to die for your ideas. You can starve. You can chant. 
you can imagine that I have uh, hinted at some special something you should do, that you should be running 112 miles a day, you particularly. And you can become fanatical about something and say, I'll kill myself. I just know that that's what he was hinting, and I'm just sure he knows what I want to know, and I'm just sure that he's giving some hint that if I will do that, then I'll get the answer. It's got nothing to do with this. You have got to know when to talk. You have got to know when to be quiet. You have got to know that structures grow organically, that they must grow in everything that happens in one's life. And you have got to be prepared to escape it. And you cannot do it through any amount of reason. You can't do it, of course, through any amount of ordinarily so-called excuses. You can't plan your way out of it. You can't think your way into it. Should we leave on a negative note? <laughs> Only you can't, you can't, you can't. All the world's great ministers and religious people do. I don't know why I can't. Well, forget those small timers. All the world's great weathermen and economic forecasters do. That feels much better. Well, my forecast is this, that all forecasts are shoddy. My weather report is you should be on the lookout for a squall line of fat people. <laughs> in a sense, anybody actually involved with this, a real revolutionist, in a sense that is, I'll have to leave it with you believing it's metaphorical, that there is a way in which someone has got to be prepared to die to do this. But it's not to die for ideas, because any idea you had is not worth dying for. Even if your idea is that I'm a great guy, even if your idea is that I know the secret and that you'll someday get it, that's not worth dying for. The only thing worth dying for is that which cannot be said. The only thing worth dying for is that which the thing right now in you that says it would can't comprehend. So anything it says it'll die for is a waste of time. Don't make me say stuff like, well, it's bullshit. <laughs> for you to believe that you would die for a religious idea, that you believe you would die for a philosophical, a political idea, you're nuts. We're going to nuts someday. You should have a severe fear, more severe than the middle class, that you could do yourself harm, that you could act in ways not in your own best interest. You're on good ground to believe that. You're on real good ground to believe that. The only thing it's worth dying for, anything in you right now can't say what it is. And anything that it believes it would die for is useless. And worse than that, it distracts you. It'll catch you up in the structure. The whole idea of dying, of course, is another subject. And I don't mean physical death. I mean, being able to shock yourself into the point that you're almost a stranger, that you can almost shed yourself, <coughs> if not yearly, periodically, to where all the things, including what you thought you'd gotten through this kind of activity, all the things that became near and dear to you, you got to go. Because they all collect dust. They all build up their own structures. Life will do it. You can't stop it. That it becomes these mechanical growth structures that life needs but then you and the things you think you've gained, then you and those things become sterile. You become moribund. You quit individually growing, and you suddenly are now the bird watchers club. You're suddenly now the clubhouse. You're the Jews. You're the Jews membership committee. You're the cards that they hand out when you pay the Jews. You're everything except a bird watcher. To be a bird watcher, you eventually got to leave the club. I know what I was saying originally, if you can hear both of them, that not literally is this necessary. 
But to stay a bird watcher, you eventually got to leave the club. Anything you really like, you originally, you, init you eventually have got to give up. Because if you liked it, if you had an interest in it, people, hobbies, whatever it is, the time comes that it reaches a new level of a structure going on. And it doesn't mean that you have to leave the person forever, that you have to give up this interest in music or art or whatever, but the level at which you now have a structure, you got to give that up. You got to walk away from it. Again, I don't mean this literally, but it would be like that you have written these 10 symphonies. Fuck what Mahler thought, that you can go ahead and a man can write 10 full symphonies without dying, but you reach the point that the 10 symphonies, now your structure between you and those 10 symphonies is like, there's my life, there's my life. If it was a real revolutionist, he would have to go and burn those 10 symphonies. Or announce to the world, I don't want to ever play it again, I stole them. I didn't write those things. You know, if you play them again, give credit, and he'd make up somebody's name. I stole them from my grandfather that died. I didn't write those things. You eventually have got to shock yourself. You've got to abandon yourself. I, I don't mean shock in the way that you would take it. You have got to be able to shed, to walk away from this new structure. It doesn't mean you have to leave the hobby, the interest, or a person. But you've got to leave the level that this structure has taken on. It is like now vines. It is an obscene choking kudzu between you and the person, between you and the thing, and you've got to walk away from it. You've got to shed yourself of it, and you may start on another level, very likely. There's nothing wrong with that. But you can't go back to where you were. That is a form of useful death. It doesn't take him hemlock. Plus, they don't have to drive those real, real painful nails through your, <laughs> through your hands and stuff. You know. That'll give you the willies just thinking about that. <laughs> Of course, I know some of you are more inclined to have the willies than others. <coughs> Good night, Willie.